on an eventful Formula One season in their Christmas special. Last season already confined to the history books and another one just around the corner. Formula One never seems to stop. Welcome to a look back at another season of Grand Prix racing full of twists, turns, mistakes, rules, new rules, triumph and tears. It all happened this year and for the next hour we'll be looking back at the drama of Formula One 1999. While we have the luxury to stop and reflect for a while, it's not so for the competitors. Preparations are already well underway for the 2000 season here at Jerez in southern Spain and that's the setting for today's programme. Coming up, we relive everything that mattered in 1999 in the battle between McLaren and Ferrari for the title. We look at how the season unfolded for all the other teams. We spend time with championship runner-up Eddie Irvine enjoying another hectic off-season. James Allen catches up with two-times world champion Mika Hakkinen and there's a trip down memory lane to look at the historical Jaguar name a truly British racing institution and the new Formula One team for 2000. Plus a few surprises during the next hour. But first, let's go back to where it all began. There was plenty of optimism as the season got underway in Australia. The battle at the front resuming where it left off the previous year. Here's James Allen. This was the most unpredictable championship of the decade, but it was always going to be a straight fight between McLaren and Ferrari. Pre-season testing showed that McLaren's new challenger was fast, but potentially fragile. It looks to me as though the Finn has done it. Half a second. That is a mega lap from Mika Hakkinen. Michael Schumacher stalled on the restart and was sent to the back of the grid, so that left the McLarens looking set to repeat their one-two of the previous year but both retired by lap 22. Leaving Eddie Irvine to control the race. It was the Irishman's first Grand Prix win and he was absolutely ecstatic. We have done it here, the first race of the season. Um, is, 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 and to win in Ferrari, it's, it's mega. Pretty sure you will turn over Melbourne. <laughs> Party on. <laughs> in Brazil, the fight resumed. Coulthard was the victim of more problems. He burned his clutch out at the start and soon retired from the race. Hackenden's gearbox began playing up and he lost two places, but fought back brilliantly to regain the lead from Schumacher, going on to win by four seconds. Clearly the McLarens were the class of the field, but it would take them almost half a season to get on top of their reliability problems. And in that time, Ferrari closed the performance gap. So to the first European race, Imola, and Hakkinen again showed his domination. He was a full 12 seconds in the lead on lap 17, but then he hooked a wheel over the kerb and lost it. Oh, off, 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 off goes Mika Hakkinen! This left Coulthard to uphold McLaren honour, but he made heavy going of passing traffic. Ferrari's Ross Braun made an aggressive switch of strategy, which put Schumacher in the lead. Meanwhile, Irvine suffered what was to prove his only technical retirement of the year. Schumacher's victory was the first for Ferrari at Imola since 1983, and the team were now 1-2 in the World Championship. Meanwhile, Hakkinen could only reflect on what might have been. The race at drivers, we never said it was our fault. <laughs> and I was on the kerb, coming out of the corner, and just by the rear tyres dropped off the kerb, he spun the car around and, and there's no way I could have handled the machine, it just slide on the wall. Winning at Monaco is always about who gets the best start, so Schumacher made a special trip to the Ferrari test track on his day off to practice. It paid off, both he and Irvine leapfrogged their McLaren rivals to hold first and third on the opening lap. Coulthard 
Lombard's challenge ended in retirement for the third time in four races. He seemed to be getting all the bad luck. Schumacher was away by himself and impressively took his 16th victory for Ferrari, making him its most successful driver in the team's 70-year history. Irvine was a delighted second, with Hakkinen third, but with just 14 points in the bank and a long way to go. After a dominating 1-2 walkover by McLaren in Spain, the circus moved to Canada. Hakkinen scored one of his most important victories of the year, one which took him to the top of the championship for the first time. In the battle for the number twos, Coulthard and Irvine got caught up once again. David Coulthard passes Andy Irvine, no he doesn't, oh my goodness! Then this rare but catastrophic mistake put Michael Schumacher into the wall. Michael Schumacher is threading his way through the field. He's... Oh, oh, Mark Schumacher out of the race! Advantage Hakkinen. Irvine was on fire, slashing his way through the field in one of the comeback drives of the year. Hakkinen had never won before in Canada, and better still, the ten points gave him the lead in the World Championship over his arch-rival Schumacher. Today, everything just went perfect, you know, I, I, won, I won the race, okay, Michael went off, he made a mistake or whatever happened, but, you know, it's great to finish like this. Manucor may look grey and drab, but this year's race was anything but. The rain would throw everyone a curved ball, both in qualifying and the race. Ferrari's legendary pit discipline broke down, as Irvine was given the wrong tyres and lost almost 40 seconds and the chance of victory. Schumacher's luck was no better. He had to change steering wheels due to a gear selection problem. Hakkinen was driving an excellent race, passing literally dozens of cars en route to a valuable second place, albeit after this mistake at the hairpin. Schumacher and Irvine, meanwhile, disputed the minor placings. Irvine followed team orders and stayed behind, but little did he know, this lost point here probably cost him the title later in the season. Schumacher was under big pressure at Silverstone, with Hakkinen now eight points clear. Schumacher made a poor start, and as Irvine refused to let him through, the red flag was thrown to stop the race. Oblivious, Schumacher was on the limit and suffered a freakish brake failure. He left the track at over 150 miles an hour. As he struggled to get out, we all knew it spelled the end of his championship hopes. His first words to the doctor were, Tell my wife I've broken my leg. At the restart, Hakkinen led until he picked up a vibration in his rear wheel. A few laps later, it parted company. Oh, there's a wheel off. Is that a McLaren? That's Hakkinen, lost his left rear. Coulthard kept out of trouble and emerged with the upper hand on the track, sealing a much needed first win of the season. I was looking desperately for the checkered flags, you know, just to confirm that it was the last lap. You know, this is definitely the best moment in my racing career. Most people thought that Hakkinen was home and dry for the championship after Silverstone. But if you think about it, it could just as easily have been Mika breaking his leg at Imola. And after those first eight races, uh, four wins to McLaren, three wins to Ferrari, I was mighty impressed with Frenson's drive at that incredible race in France. I was mighty impressed with Rubens Barrichello in Brazil and France. And if you think about it, a bit of history made in Canada when the race finished behind the safety car for the first time ever. Absolutely, and we saw there too that McLaren were very fast, but falling apart a little bit. The Ferrari seemed to be unburstable, but off the pace. And they keep building this car and team around Michael Schumacher. Yeah. Yeah. Turns up at the first few races and doesn't seem to have the speed. I think that's because they test too much of their home circuit of Fiorano. And it's interesting to see them here in Jerez so early. Eddie Irvine led the championship at that first race. He would twice lose the lead of the championship yeah. and regain it, yeah. just to show that he was a genuine contender season long. So, in a matter of seconds, the season was transformed, and all of a sudden, Eddie Irvine found himself the unlikely number one at Ferrari, with a fight on his hands against Mika Hakkinen and David Coulthard. Louise Goodman reports. After four years at Ferrari, Eddie Irvine finally stepped out of Michael Schumacher's shadow to lead the team. 
Yeah, it is a golden opportunity. Hopefully, you know, I, I do feel a lot better about my job now. You know, no one likes being number two, that's for sure. But it was, as I've always said, it was the best opportunity for me. Mikasolo found himself standing in for another injured driver, but Ferrari was a very different proposition to BAR. It was business as usual at McLaren, Hakkinen on pole and Coulthard alongside for the start. But on the opening lap, the Silverstone winner made a dramatic move on the fin. Oh, Coulthard and Hakkinen touch! And off goes the McLaren! Mika Hakkinen is off the track! He's going to have to storm his way through the field! And he did back up to fourth as the pit stops began. Whilst leader Coulthard made his stop, Irvine ate away at the McLaren's advantage, gaining track position and ultimately the lead. Nice stop by Ferrari. Is it good enough? Oh, is it good enough? Well, it's good yes, enough it is. so it far. Is, look. Coulthard kept up the pressure all the way to record the closest Grand Prix finish since Monaco 92. This is the last corner and Eddie Irvine wins brilliantly, brilliantly. So far, so good then for the new Ferrari number one. Germany and things got even better for the Italian team and worse for McLaren. Hakkinen got away well at the start, but Mika Salo was the man really on the move. Salo is sprinting up on the left and taking second position. Ferrari oh. and off goes, off goes Pedro Diniz. By the first chicane, Irvine was struggling down in sixth place. Coulthard damaged a wing trying to pass Salo, but it was nothing compared to his teammates' experience. I was just looking in my mirror, I was just looking in my mirror, and then it just went bang. Oh, no. oh Mika Hakkinen, Mika Hakkinen collides, and into the tyres, out of the race, no points. When you spin off like that, you know, you, you, you do get some more grey hair, I tell you. Ferrari controlled the race with Salo leading, but he bowed to the inevitable and moved over for Irvine. This win had been gifted, and he knew it. Race by race, McLaren were throwing away points. Hakkinen needed a victory in Hungary to put his championship chase back on course. This time there could be no mistakes, and there were none. Mika dominated from lap one. That's a bad, bad start for David Coulthard and a good, good start for Mika Hakkinen. Whilst the Finn drew the perfect race, Eddie Irvine struggled with a faulty differential. Irvine running wide in turn three. That's going to let Coulthard through without any question at all. Hakkinen's faultless drive from lights to checkered flag ensured the victory for the Finn and restored faith in his team. It also tightened up the points battle. He was now just two points adrift of Eddie Irvine. At the classic spa for Uncle Sean's circuit, McLaren seemed back on track. They clearly had the dominant package, but who would make best use of it? Good one for David Coulthard, who edges up alongside Mika Hakkinen, who is on the inside. And the two McLarens actually touched. There was no damage, but Hakkinen was clearly rattled by the incident and seemed content to settle for second as he trailed around in Coulthard's wake. The celebrations were muted and Hakkinen was conspicuous by his absence. He uh, deserved, deserved the win. He was a little bit tense at the first corner, but that's motor racing. At Monza, the Tifosi were out in force and the mood at Ferrari was buoyant after a successful pre-race test. But that mood quickly turned sour as Irvine found six cars separating him from his championship rival on the starting grid. Hakkinen rubbed salt into Ferrari's wounds. Starting from pole position, the Finn quickly established a comfortable lead, perhaps too comfortable. Oh, and that's Hakkinen spinning! Hakkinen, the race leader! He's out of the race! He's out of the race! And Mika Hakkinen, after the misery of Belgium, is consumed with rage. The Italian Grand Prix has gone mega. He's crying his eyes out in amongst the trees. Hakkinen well, absolutely distraught. To say I made a mistake, I'm sorry, you know, selected wrong here. So I made a mistake, and that's it. End of story. For Irvine, it was a case of more damage limitation. Yet again, McLaren's misfortunes had thrown the Ferrari driver a lifeline. At the Nürburgring, the forecasters were predicting rain. And they were right. McLaren responded immediately, calling Hakkinen in for wets. It was a premature move and cost the Finn dear, but at least the McLaren boys found all the tyres. Well, this is ludicrous. This is now blown it. going to have a committee meeting about it. Stick it on and send him out. Well, this has blown it for Irvine, blown it for Ferrari. I don't know what's happened. Coulthard was looking good and in the points when the skies opened once more. It was like an F1 demolition derby and the Scots luck ran out. Oh, and no. Coulthard. Coulthard off 
left the road. David Coulthard has gone off. Hakkinen finally decided to pick up the pace when he sensed the opportunity for points. He was right on Irvine's tail and finally the pressure forced the Irishman into a mistake. Hakkinen takes the place. Hakkinen takes that position. Irvine went scampering across the chicane, outbraked himself and moves into a world championship point. Two races to go and just two points separated Hakkinen and Irvine at the top of the championship table. The battle looks set to run its full course. After weeks of speculation, Michael Schumacher finally returned to the cockpit in Malaysia to bolster Irvine's championship hopes. And despite a three-month layup, he positively blew away the opposition. Schumacher goes 1.1 seconds faster. In the race, Schumacher took an early lead but soon dropped back to allow Irvine through. Schumi's going to let him through, look. Coulthard passed him too. Coulthard having a look early. Oh, he's touched. He's touched Schumacher, Coulthard touched Schumacher. Can Hakkinen get through at the same time? No, he can't. But Coulthard's race soon ended with engine failure. Hakkinen's McLaren remained glued to the Ferrari's rear wing as Schumacher controlled the Finns' pace. The tactics ensured a jubilant one-two for Ferrari, but the celebrations would be short-lived. Post-race checks revealed irregularities on the Ferrari's barge boards. Irvine and Schumacher were stripped of their points. Little did a frustrated and exhausted Hakkinen know that he was technically world champion. But the FIA saw it differently. The Court of Appeal decided to overturn the decision of the stewards and therefore the original result of the race stands in its entirety. In Japan, for the final showdown, the Finn looked the stronger of the two, and Irvine's confidence took a tumble in qualifying. But oh, uh, that's Irvine, Irvine off big time and lost a wheel, of course. In order to be sure of back-to-back -back titles, Hakkinen had to stay in front of the Ferraris, and he pulled off one of his best ever starts when he needed it most. Nicker Hakkinen, a marvellous start, and he's streaking away already. This is exactly what the Finn wanted. It was a performance worthy of a world champion. Coulthard was keen to make his mark, but this crash put him out of the frame, leaving Ferrari to collect the team's first constructors' title since 1983. But the day and the 1999 Formula One World Championship belonged to McLaren's Mika Hakkinen. If I would end up second in the first corner, I would be history. I know that. So it worked, you know, just a good start, clean start. Put down, everything was fine. No disrespect to Eddie Irvine, Martin, but you have to look at his superb season in the light of the fact that two of his races were gifted to him because Mika Sala moved over and led him through in Germany. Michael Schumacher made the race for him in Malaysia. But things certainly didn't go well for McLaren in that second half. I mean, in Germany, they had that fuel ring problem, then the tyre. Uh, Mika Hakkinen dissolves into tears, understandably, at Monza. But great win for Johnny Herbert at the, at, uh, the Nürburgring. And for me, the race of the year was Malaysia. Fantastic new circuit, wonderful facilities. And Michael Schumacher came back after six races away and showed us how to do it. Incredible. Yes, that was the best driver of the year there for Michael. Closely followed, I think, by uh, Hakkinen in Hungary and Coulthard at Spa, really super performances. That shunt of Hakkinen's in Hockenheim was really scary. That's the one you fear most as a driver when you have no control whatsoever. But there were four moments that I think cost Eddie Irvine the world championship. It was uh, when he was not allowed to pass Michael Schumacher at the French Grand Prix, yeah. when he ran wide in Hungary and let Coulthard through, when he outbraked himself at the Nürburgring, releasing Hakkinen, who went off then to get two more world championship points, and he just simply wasn't fast enough in Japan. Oh, that's true. That's it for a few moments, but join us again after the break. Welcome back to the programme. After a hectic finale to the season, Eddie Irvine's had an equally busy off-season. Louise Goodman caught up with the Irishman to reflect on a breakthrough 1999 during a recent trip to London. Did you actually enjoy Japan? Because it's always been your favourite circuit, hasn't it? Yeah, I was just off the pace all weekend, just massively off the pace. And I wasn't getting into the car thinking, Jesus, I'm slow here, I'm slow there. 
I just, I, I was driving around thinking, geez, I'm, I'm, that's it, there's no more left in the car. And I was nowhere. What did you think of Hackman's no. performance there? Fantastic, you know, really. He, you know, he did a fantastic job. He deserved the championship, you know. When the pressure was on, he had to make the start. Michael didn't make the start. Mika made the start. Um, their strategy was the correct strategy for him making the start. Um, and that was it. He did a fantastic job, didn't make any mistakes, um, and was blinding all weekend. You got to hats off to him. You know? You would have, I guess, well, would you in your mind have thought, well, I've only won this because of Michael? Because there would have been people who said that. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, the, the previous years, he would have had to say, you know, he won it because I, I moved over and I helped him in certain instances. So, you know, it, it, it's, we didn't have the car to win the championship. At the end of the day, that's, it came down to that, you know, as we, didn't have, we haven't had the car for the last four years. Um, you know, Michael's only won in the last eight years. This won a this won a championship in a non-Adrian Newey car. You know, Damon had a big car advantage when he won it. Jack was the same. Um, Prost, Mansell. Um, there's only Michael's the one that's beat, and there's only one that can beat Adrian Newey, and. Um, that's the dilemma of Formula 1 at the minute. <laughs> For now, Eddie's dilemma is getting through another book signing session. But it's not all hard work being an F1 celebrity. Later that night, he clearly enjoyed himself as a judge at Miss World. You travel the world racing and everything. You must come across some of the world's most beautiful women. But the girls here tonight, they've been stunning, haven't they? It's fantastic. It's a dream come true for me to be a judge at Miss World, to be honest. Um, uh, but it, I, at the same time, it's a very serious thing for these girls, and, and you want to do the best. All right. Was it a tough decision to bring it down to five now? You know, um, I sort of looked at the girls and thought, right, I want to choose the, you know, the ones that you would have as your wife. But at the end of it, I had 90 potential wives, you know? So I had to go through it all again and again and again. And it, 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 it's murder, it really is. You don't, I never believed it would be so difficult. <laughs> All right, do you have the announcement of the five finalists with you? I haven't got it with me, actually. I, I had it. Well, that's good. Um, no one actually gave it to me, but I'm sure I could, if I look at these girls, I can remember it. Now, what about the 1999 season for the Jordan team? Well, it was a season of contrasting fortunes. Sadly, Damon Hill didn't see out his career the way he would have liked, but for Heights Harold Frentzen, it was magic, helping the team to their best season yet. Jordan's steady climb to the top of Formula One took a quantum leap in 1999, the small Silverstone-based team placing third in both drivers' and constructors' tables, thanks to a fast, reliable car, a powerful engine, and some inspired driving by Heinz Harold Frentzen. He gave us a sign of what was to come in Melbourne, where he chased Irvine down to finish second. There were plenty of strong runs. At Hockenheim, he qualified second and finished third. Frentzen was competitive virtually everywhere, a reflection of his strength of character after being dropped by Williams at the end of last season. Frentzen won twice in 1999. His most impressive show of skill was during a chaotic French Grand Prix. Jordan and Heinz Harold Frentzen win, win, win in France. Magnificent. At Monza, he picked up the lead after Hacken and made his ungraceful exit. Jordan have now won three races, a true sign that the team has arrived after years of trying. For me, he is absolutely the star of 99. And we're not finished yet, we have three races to go. And who knows, it could be the dream championship, but we're going to fight very hard for it. It would be a nice thought. Frentzen was leading the race and in contention for the championship when his onboard computer shut down at the Nürburgring, robbing him of a win. All but seven of Jordan's points were scored by Frentzen, the rest by Damon Hill, who retired from Grand Prix racing after a hugely disappointing season. Outpaced by his teammate from the start, he decided to call it a day after hitting the wall in Canada. But rather than stop immediately, he chose to see out the year, and in the second half of the season was a faint shadow of the man who won the World Championship just three years earlier. Frustration because it's another race week weekend where it's gone wrong and I'm not in the points and um, 
uh, you know, that's just not uh, not what I'm interested in. On occasions, he pulled out the old magic, like at Spa, where he qualified fourth. But the truth was, he never really got to grips with the groove tyres in Formula One. It all ended on a low note in Suzuka, Japan, where he retired a healthy car and hung up his F1 gloves forever. Now established behind the big two, Jordan is looking to attack next season and has hired the highly rated Italian Jarno Trulli as Hill's successor. If the talented young Jordan engineers can produce another solid car, they could spring a few surprises in 2000. 99 was also a great year for the young Stewart team. A maiden victory and a very respectable fourth place in the Constructors' Championship. And all that in just their third season of Formula One. This was the season Stuart came of age, but it wasn't all plain sailing and they had the worst possible start as both cars felt the heat on the grid in Melbourne. That's Rubens Barrichello. Well, this is appalling for the Stuart team. There was more frustration in round two, reliability being a major cause for concern. Barrichello led in Brazil before his engine blew. But it was Johnny Herbert who suffered most. He didn't register a finish until Canada, coming home fifth on the same weekend that Ford announced they'd bought the team in a multi-million pound deal. Rubens' finest hour came in France with the team's first pole position. Barrichello judged the wet conditions perfectly, clearly impressing Ferrari, who would soon sign him up for 2000, and giving the Stewart boys plenty to celebrate. The historic first win came later at the Nürburgring. Johnny Herbert tiptoed through the puddles at the rain-swept European Grand Prix, keeping his head whilst all around were losing theirs. It was a popular victory and a fantastic result for Stewart in only their third season. Johnny Herbert in the Stewart takes the chicken flag to win! And there is Jackie Stewart. Well, our oh, words fail me. We need a little bit of luck, but it was a hell of a race and we're very proud. And to have two on the podium is pretty sensational. Forced to buy that maiden victory, Jackie's boys up the ante. Herbert in particular was on a run. He out-qualified and out-raced his teammate in Malaysia, just missing out on a podium finish when he succumbed to pressure from Hakkinen's McLaren. With Barrichello following his teammate home, the result was sufficient to snatch fourth in the Constructors' Series away from Williams. The team are brimming with confidence as they prepare for 2000 as Jaguar. Jordan kindly lent us a car and a team, of course, for our F1 driving school. And having now driven that, I'm not at all surprised they had a great season. The French in any way. Consistent, fast, got those two wins. Although I was a bit concerned from time to time he was driving only for points and podiums. He didn't pull off any one move that you thought, wow, that was spectacular, but a well-deserved championship position. Damon, a terrible year. Without doubt, he went on one season too long, but a great career nonetheless. You know, as far as Stewart's concerned, having forecasts that they would not do well in 99, I can't say how glad I am that they did. Super year, wonderful win for Johnny in, uh, at the Nürburgring. Rubens Barrichello could have won in Brazil, he could have won in France, he had three third places, and Gary Anderson, who'd gone from Jordan, did a super job, but it took Stewart three years to win a Grand Prix, it took Jordan eight years. Stewart are looking to go from strength to strength with the arrival of a famous name to take over the reins in Milton Keynes. For the first time ever, the Jaguar Racing Green will be seen in Formula One. A good opportunity then to take a look back at a great motor racing heritage. Jaguar began life in Blackpool in 1922 as the Swallow Sidecar Company, created by William Lyons, a young motorcycle enthusiast with a burning ambition and a thousand pound overdraft. Swallow Sidecars sold well, and the company moved into car production with the evocative SS sports car. But as war approached, Bill Lyons realised there was a problem. The name SS wasn't very popular. I don't think um, it would have done very, very much to give it any prestige. And I asked our publicity people to let me have a list of um, animals, birds and so on. And I picked Jaguar out and thought it was very good. Post-war, Jaguar introduced the sensational XK120, which won national races and rallies. 
and that led to private entries at the Le Mans 24 hour race where the car showed enough promise to prompt Lance to build the XK120C. C for competition. Jaguar entered Le Mans with a full factory team of C-types in 1951. After a race-long battle with the larger engine Ferraris, they won with a young Sterling Moss among the drivers. Jaguar pioneered the use of disc brakes and racing aerodynamics, which helped them to first, second and fourth places at the 1953 Le Mans race, with the C-Type's successor, the D-Type, winning again in 1955, 56 and 57, a hat-trick. But Jaguar was finding it too hard both to race and design and develop new road cars. Something had to go the team pulled out of Works Motorsport. But then, in 1982, Jaguar started a new era in its racing history. The fabled XJS touring car was prepared and raced by Tom Walkinshaw with no small success. He took the European Championship in 1984, winning seven out of 11 races. Tom's company, TWR, then persuaded Jaguar that the future was in sports cars and a return to their spiritual home, Le Mans. How right he was. In 1988, the result, the XJR9 LM, won both Le Mans and the World Sports Car Championship in style. The cat was back. Two years later, Jaguar won at Le Mans again, with a familiar face on the podium. But soon, activities in the boardroom would overshadow those on the track, and Jaguar pulled out of motorsport altogether. Now, though, Ford has brought the Jaguar name back to the top. Jackie Stewart, no stranger to Jaguars himself, will still lead the team he founded as Stewart Grand Prix. And the famous British Racing Green colours will serve as a reminder to everybody of Jaguar's rich racing heritage. Martin, when it comes to Jaguar, I gladly defer to you. You won touring car races for them. You won the World Sports Car Championship for them. You won Le Mans for them. All I want to say is it's a joy to think of a green-painted Jaguar in Formula One. Looking good? I think it is. I'd love to win Grand Prix for them, but that job falls to uh, Eddie Irvine, of course, and Johnny Herbert. And I think they've got a good starting point, of course, taking over the Stewart team. Yeah. But you know, Murray, you can paint a car any colour you like, call it any name you like. At the end of the day, it's the group of people you've got working on the project times the amount of money they have to spend that gets the results. But I really hope they do something special. That's it for a few moments. Plenty more to come. Join us after the break. The 1999 Formula One season was always going to be tough for Williams, but even they will be disappointed to have finished fifth in the constructors' table, a sad way to end a decade they dominated. One of the main reasons for the team's slump was power, or rather, lack of it. Williams had to cope with less grunt than their competitors while they waited for their works BMW engine deal to come online next year. Despite this, Ralph Schumacher found the Williams experience much to his liking. Having been inconsistent at Jordan, he thrived under the down-to-earth leadership of Patrick Head and Frank Williams. Driving a car that on occasion had distinctly canine qualities, Ralph notched up 11 points finishes, ending the season in sixth place in the table, just behind his brother Michael. He came within an inch of winning the European Grand Prix at the Nürburgring, outracing the McLarens on a tricky, damp track. Before that unlucky puncture sidelined him. But while Ralph was a revelation, Alex Zanardi was surely one of the disappointments of the year. He never got to grips with the modern, nervous Formula One machines, and his record of 11 retirements and no points was one of the worst for a Williams driver in living memory. I don't think I've, I've ever had so many problems in my, my career. It's, uh, it's just incredible, and uh, we got a lot of problems right now. I got all the faith in the world that people here have the capability to solve it. Uh, it's just a question of time. Time had run out by Monza. This gutsy drive was the highlight of his season, but it wasn't enough, and it seems now that he may have lost the drive for good.
Benetton had their worst season in over a decade. The car was overweight and underpowered, and time and again the drivers complained it lacked grip. Second place for Giancarlo Fisichella at the Canadian Grand Prix was one of the few moments of light relief. Indeed, it was the team's only podium finish of the season. The Italian was certainly the stronger of the driver pairing, showing well in Hungary and leading at the Nürburgring before spinning out in the rain. Fifth was the best finish Alexander Wurtz could muster this season. In fact, he scored just three points all year against Fisichella's 13. It was a bad year for Benetton and a simply awful first year at the helm for Rocco Benetton. Sweet and sour for Williams. We, we just saw the best of Alex Zanardi in those shots. And I feel so sorry for him. He came over as top man from America, back to Formula One, and he just failed to cut the mustard. But what a difference between him and Ralph Schumacher. It's toss-up, as far as I'm concerned, whether Frentzen or Schumacher is the top man of the season. I think, on balance, Schumacher, because he had a second place, he had a fastest lap, he was in the points 11 times, and that in a car which, at the beginning of the season, really wasn't quite up to it. Ralph did the business, but uh, Benetton certainly didn't, Murray. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I think the new wind tunnel they've got in place will only come into effect on the 2000 car. The 99 car simply didn't work. Looked as if they couldn't get the power down sure. on the racetrack. Yeah, yeah. Fisichella had a couple of sparkling races. Canada, he finished second, was yeah. leading at the Nürburgring, yeah. could easily yeah. have won that. Wurtz simply did not deliver the goods at all. So, mixed fortunes for the top six constructors this year. But what about the other end of the grid? The competition's just as fierce there. Much was expected from Prost Peugeot this year. But despite a strong technical side and two decent drivers, they failed to make much of an impression. Jarno Trulli got the better of Olivier Panis over the season, the highlight being his second place at the Nürburgring. But morale wasn't helped by a shaky relationship with Peugeot and the announcement that both drivers would be replaced next year by Jean Alessi and young hotshot Nick Heidfeld. Sauber also had another mediocre season, finishing with only five points on the board. Even though Pedro Diniz brought home three of them, the team appeared to build itself around Jean Alessi, only for the Frenchman to desert them in a rage. Salba strengthened links with their engine supplier Ferrari by taking on Mika Salo for next year to rejoin his old Arrows teammate Diniz. But the Swiss team still look like they're going nowhere fast. Arrows finished ninth in the constructors' table, which isn't bad when you consider they only scored one point all year. They came to the first race with what was effectively last year's car. It ran reliably and Pedro de la Rosa brought it home to sixth place. But the more new parts the team added to the A20, the more things started to break. Add to this minimal development, limited testing time, and a budget that would struggle to keep Ferrari in cappuccinos, and you realise why Tom Walkinshaw has had little to smile about recently. Minardi, on the other hand, had a much better season than many expected. Marc Genet's one point at the Nürburgring was like a victory for the small Italian team. The human part of Minardi is really good. And they deserved it more than anyone. It's three years without the point was far too much. So my smile won't go away, but really full credit to the team. Luca Badua was on course for fourth place at the same race before the car broke down, with Badua following shortly after. Now, if you think 99 was a bad year for those four, it doesn't even come close to what the brand new BAR team went through. Pre-season promises came to nothing, as James Allen explains. With a bold fanfare and a budget sufficient to go to war and win, British American Racing was born in 1999. But the schizophrenic colour scheme hinted at a team which was more deeply divided. With a Reynard chassis, a Supertech engine and former world champion Jacques Villeneuve, as well as former 3000 champion Ricardo Zonta, the team couldn't go wrong, could it? Well, yes, in fact, it went very wrong. Zonta broke his leg in a massive accident in Brazil and missed three races. But worse was yet to come. Villeneuve didn't finish a race until round 12 in Belgium, and of the four he did finish, his highest placing was only eighth. Lack of reliability meant the team couldn't develop the car to find more speed. They were always playing catch-up and learning the Formula One ropes the hard way. It was only once that the car looked special, in Barcelona, where Villeneuve qualified sixth and ran ahead of Schumacher in third place for a while. 
Internal wrangling and purges of key personnel went on throughout the year and there were constant rumours about team boss Craig Pollock being replaced by Adrian Reynard. Nowhere were the problems more apparent than in Belgium. A high-speed crash at Eau Rouge came first for Villeneuve. And then minutes later, his teammate Zonta suffered the same fate. Oh, that's, that's a, a terrible crash. And it's Zonta in the other BAR. With no race cars left, two test cars had to be brought out and a through-the-night rebuild commenced. But after all that, Villeneuve only finished a lowly 15th. Pretty useless. Uh, we were very slow in the race and uh, finishing 15th or, or running 4th and not finishing, it's still the same end result, no points. Locked in a David versus Goliath battle with Minardi for last place, they went to the final race in Japan needing to score their first point. They failed and in the process lost an estimated $15 million in prize money and travel benefits. Once again they will occupy the end garage in the pit lane next year. You know, BAR were an object lesson in how not to do it. They fell out with the governing body over the car livery before the season ever began. They had all the money in the world. They seemed to have the right people, wonderful factory facilities, Jacques Villeneuve. They were going to win their first race, they said. But when the talking stopped, so did the car. Where did it all go wrong? Well, pit lane gossip has it that they were over budget by as much as, if not even more, than Jordan would spend in any given year in total. Wow. I think some internal politics, too, didn't help at all. I mean, I said a couple of times, any car that's painted those kind of colour schemes is never going to be successful. <laughs> People thought I was joking completely, but I wasn't. I think it just demonstrated that the whole thing started off on the wrong footing. But I think with a Honda engine and a second year at it, they'll be much better. But one thing I must say from a driver perspective, Jacques Villeneuve never gave up despite yeah. a terrible time. Absolutely. Back to our champion, Mika Hakkinen, who's now even more special now that he's won the title two years in succession. It was a tough and demanding battle for him all the way and at times it seemed as though he might crack. But he didn't, and he won. James Allen caught up with him recently. Mika, only seven drivers have done the double. Ascari, Fangio, Brabham, Senna, Prost, Schumacher, and now you're one of the magnificent seven. Must be a fantastic feeling. It is a great achievement indeed, and, and it, it feels good. Uh, and what I also realized this year, it was to do that, to be able to win Back to back, it is very, very difficult. Why? Why? Yeah. Um, naturally, you know, when you when you win a championship, you know, people expect a lot from you to next year to do also great jobs, and uh, the pressure obviously is is very high for the performance also for the team members, you know, the mechanics and designers and and whole package, and uh, so the failures, if you know, and always there will be some failures and, and mistakes. They are much more difficult to uh, take, you know, because people, you know, people don't expect, you know, the team or the driver to do mistakes because they done, they won already one world championship. So everybody expect the, expecting the team to to create job, and and that's one of the reasons. Very very difficult. But did it work, make it worse that everybody was saying, oh, well, Michael Schumacher's out when he went and crashed out at Silverstone. Now it's a foregone conclusion that Mika Hakkinen is going to win this world championship. Did, it, did that make it worse, the pressure, if you like? No, it did not make it worse. No. You can look the situation at a very different angle, mm -hmm. certainly. First of all, Michael's uh, uh, accident was very bad, to be honest. I, I think uh, whoever driver has accident in, in a Grand Prix racing is is always very traumatic and, and very bad like, because I have personally experiences in 95 obviously uh, but did, did a uh, the things obviously yes people started talking about okay this is easy now and Mika and you know the McLaren they're gonna win it now easily because uh, Michael is not racing the rest of the season and and uh, but I personally didn't ever take a uh, approach myself. This is going to be easy, you know. I every time went to Grand Prix to score the ten points. But weird things happened, like you know, during the season, you know, and and uh, 
now looking back, it's actually good. It's nice to sit here today and, and the knowing we did it really uh, a tough way and, and we really worked hard to able to get the championship. So now it feels good. You talk about weird things that happened in the season. Obviously, one of the weirdest is the two big mistakes you made at Imola <laughs> at Monza. I never thought I'd see you crying in the bushes uh, ever. But I mean, that w must have been obviously a very difficult experience for you, the, it, whole, the whole thing. Was there any coincidence that both of those incidents happened in Italy? Were you trying so desperately to win on Ferrari's home soil, or was it just because they just happened? No, the, the, it was just the. There was just a tactic. What we, it sounds maybe strange, but we have a certain tactics, and and we calculated during the race. Uh, uh, okay, I was leading about ten seconds. But, but certainly we were also looking at the, what other drivers are doing, how many fuel stops they're going to do. We have a car set it in an extremely optimum setup, optimum uh, uh, fuel, uh, things like that. So I needed to push certain amount of cap for the second driver. Otherwise, when I stop, they can overtake me if they, example, in a one stop. So I was pushing very hard. And uh, I would say that was, you know, I was racing a lot against the clock. What did you learn about yourself from that experience, particularly Monza? When you are in a situation where you're leading a championship, uh, you have a great gap in, in a, like in Monza, a great gap for the second driver. Uh, and it was easy race, basically. The car was fantastic. And then when the situation like that happens, it is really uh, uh, depressing. And, and uh, it, it really takes, you know, you give everything to type of weekend like that. You give everything psychologically physically and, and then when you fail in a silly mistake what I did it was just it was just too much to take and, and then the motions takes the power of you and, and, and then you then you just break up. But you bounced back magnificently didn't of you? Course. You kept your nerve and Japan, one of the great wins of your career, if not the greatest, with with everything that was at stake to do what you did on that day was just an awesome drive. You're right. <laughs> Going no. into it, yeah. you just presumably just said to yourself, I have to do what I do best and what I've done all my career and just... Yeah, you know, four points behind and going to last Grand Prix and you needed to win. Of course, in your mind, this, you know, you know it, it's in a situation where you, where you got to get sleep. And, and, uh, but I really took the different approach. I really changed my tactics, what I normally do for the Grand Prix. I changed my completely psychological my tactics, how I will approach the weekend, how I will do the race. And it worked. So let's talk finally then about 2000. Only one man has ever won three world championships in the run. That's one Manuel Fangio. Mm. You fancy your chances of uh, another piece of history there? Do you think you can do it again or a bit tougher challenge next year possibly? I would, I would, I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet uh, you would. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know yet how to, how to what kind of <clears throat> approach and what kind of tactic and, and psychologically how next year I will attack the season, you know, you know, again, you cannot just build the motivation for next year and say, yeah, I'm going to go to win a world championship. I don't, that, that is the wrong thing because the, the, the aim is so wide, so big, you, you're heading such a big goal, I think it's a mistake. So uh, I, I'm still working on it, but the target, of course, depends, of course, how good car the designers can make for us, for David and me, for the for for next year. It depends a lot. Uh, depends the reliability points about so many things. But the target is to go to win, of course, next year. And uh, let's hope it happens. Well, you're a great champion. Thank you very much for Thank talking you. to us, and enjoy the Millennium Eve. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. And at the end of a superb season, there was general agreement that the right man won the drivers' championship the right team won the Constructors' Championship. So now, let's look forward to an equally dramatic year 2000. See you there. In any case, I think this morning's 
to be honest, some, somebody put some locks in the first stage for us. That uh, don't understand really because Colin didn't see and it was nearly blocking the road. So that maybe also I lost a little bit of concentration. But so I try my best. And that's all. Well, we, may, we found some locks in the road that apparently were not there for Colin. But you can always find a stupid like that. The thing that we have to say is that we've never seen so many people helping us in our life like we've seen in this stage. I mean, when we thought it was impossible to get a car out, they were pushing us, we were with the moral very down. At the beginning, there were only four people, and at the end, there were maybe 70, I think, people helping us and trying to pull the car out and locks and everything. They did an incredible job. So despair for Subaru, matched in equal measure by Toyota's joy. At last, Didier Oriol could see a clear path to his first world title. The Frenchman survived a slip in the fateful Dovey section, but Sainz's loss proved to be Oriol's gain. Whether it was down to good fortune, it was hard to say. What I, what I can say, it's really luck this time. Sometimes I have really bad luck, but this time I am a really lucky driver. So, OK, I am very happy, sure. So now, going back, oh, here's Uwe. Congratulations. What do you think of this result, Uwe? Thank you very much. I think it is a long overdue title for Didier. Should have won the title in 92 and bad luck prevented it. So, okay, maybe he was helped by luck this time, but also he had a lot of bad luck in the beginning. I think he really deserves the title. Yeah. Congratulations. Sure. <laughs> Orioles teammate Jura Kankinen knows that winning feeling. The Finn gleefully grabbed the second spot vacated by Sainz to take a place on the podium for the fourth consecutive year. For Belgium's Bruno Thierry, this has been a marvellous first time outing on the RAC. He drove his escort with great distinction, earning third place and the respect of all. A great week for the 40-somethings too. Ari Vatanen boxed clever to run into fifth place. A case of anything he can do, said Stig Blomqvist. The Swede, one place better off. Sadly, Malcolm Wilson won't be joining the British celebrations. His rally ended just four stages from home with a role in Garthainjog. Wilson reduced to the role of spectator. The view was interesting, though, with Colin McRae's history-making drive. So this was how it all finished today. McRae winning by three and a half minutes from Kankin and Bruno Terry. An excellent third on his first RAC, Oriol, the world champion now in sixth spot. But the man being toasted in Chester tonight is, of course, Colin McRae, born into a rallying family. It was always his ambition to win the RAC. Born to be wild, Colin McRae, son of a rallying champion, has finally come of age. Into sixth race, 70. The year is 1987 at the McRae home in Lanark. 19-year-old Colin had toyed with motocross, but rallying was clearly the only outlet for his driving talent. The speed was there from the start, but youthful exuberance gave McRae a madman tag. Twice British champion, his RAC exploits too often ended in disaster. 1994, though, has seen McRae mature. A disastrous start to the World Championship suddenly got better. Wins in New Zealand and Australia, a controlled drive in Italy. So the RAC rally was his, if he could finally harness speed and control. So how are you going to approach the, uh, the first day? It's normal, it's 100%, and just be very, very careful. Uh, you, can't, you can't afford to drive through the first day at 90%, or someone's going to take half a minute off you. So. You've got to be as quick as you can go all the time. While all around were losing their heads, McRae kept his. He took the lead on Sunday afternoon and never looked like losing it. Urged on by the Bobble Hat Brigade, McRae was looking every inch a champion. The car, he said, was very sweet. Even the rally...